Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Europe is going to Jupiter. In a couple of days, if all goes according to plan, the JUICE spacecraft will take off from French Guiana on an Ariane 5 and begin a decades-long mission to visit the planet Jupiter and specifically look at the three large icy moons there, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa. And this mission signals the beginning of a new phase in the search for life on other planets in our solar system. Life as we know it needs water, and we spent a lot of time looking for evidence of water on Mars, which could be liquid. But in the outer solar system, the frigid conditions mean that water in its normal state is ice. Planetary scientists actually treat ice as a mineral when they're dealing with outer solar system bodies. But on the four large Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, their motion around Jupiter leads to gravitational interactions that stretch and squeeze the bodies. And that converts some of the orbital energy of the planets into thermal energy. That thermal energy allows the interiors to melt in places. And it's known, for example, that Io is so hot, is so driven to such high temperatures that it is volcanic. Europa, we've seen that there is evidence of subsurface oceans on that. And the same is true for Ganymede and Callisto. But the further you go from Jupiter, the less thermal activity there is. So JUICE is supposed to be an acronym for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, and I think that is kind of stretching the definition a little, but given the amount of time and effort and good science that we've seen put into this mission, I'm prepared to cut them a little bit of slack. So spacecraft exploring Jupiter goes back uh, quite a long way to Pioneer 10 and 11, followed by Voyager 1 and 2. These were all fly-past missions. In, in the 1990s, we launched the Galileo spacecraft, which spent many, many years orbiting Jupiter and flying past all the planets. But it didn't give us all the data we wanted because it had a huge problem with its antenna and was only able to stream data back at a trickle. Both Cassini and New Horizons were able to collect data as they flew past Jupiter on the way to their ultimate destinations. In fact, New Horizons collected more data at Jupiter than it did at Pluto, which was its primary target. And now we have the Juno spacecraft orbiting Jupiter but it is focused on the atmosphere of the planet rather than the moons. In fact, when it was originally designed, it never included a camera. But NASA kind of said, if you're going to do a mission which is costing this amount of money, you have to have a camera on board. Don't worry, we'll find some nerds on the internet who will process the imagery for you. And frankly, Juno's camera is amazing. We had so many great images that have come out of this and been processed by amateurs on the internet to bring out the beauty of this massive planet. So the JUICE mission was selected as a flagship mission by the European Space Agency back in 2012. There were many great proposals, but this is what won. Now, interestingly, we rewind to the start of the 2000s, we can see projects like NASA's incredibly ambitious Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter, which was going to use nuclear electric propulsion. It was kind of a nuclear reactor powering an ion thruster. It was going to go to all the moons. It was actually funded in 2004, and then in 2005, the th funding was dropped. But yeah, 2008, NASA and ESA began working together on a plan which would have had both, uh, you know, multiple Jupiter orbiting spacecraft working together simultaneously. So NASA would develop the Jupiter Europa orbiter and ESA would develop the Jupiter Ganymede orbiter. And JAXA was also involved with the Jupiter Magnetospheric orbiter. And I think at one point Russia was actually involved with the Laplace lander, which was hoping to land on Jupiter. And of course, none of this happened. In 2012, uh, post-financial crisis, Congress forced huge cuts to lots of government programs, including NASA. So NASA was unable to collaborate with Europe. Europe decided to go alone. Uh, Japan came on with the European program. It will put instruments on uh, juice. And of course, the Russian uh, space program didn't have the money really to start with, and it ended up diverting the funds that it had allocated to Venera. So yeah, the, uh, the European mission, the Jupiter-Ganymede orbiter, became JUICE. And despite the funding cuts in the intervening years, NASA was in fact able to put together a mission to visit Europa, the Europa Clipper. And that's supposed to launch on a Falcon Heavy next year. And so while these are now two separate missions, they are going to be there at the same time and they are still focused on the same primary targets. While JUICE is going to visit Callisto and Europa, it's going to go into orbit around Ganymede. 
and Europa Clipper is obviously focusing on the moon of Europa. Now, it's not going to get into orbit. What it's going to do is make a series of flypasses. And it, it is interesting, of course, that Europe is looking at Ganymede and NASA is looking at Europa. But there's a good technical reason for this. And it comes down to, first of all, that the closer in the moons are, the more they are heated. Io is obviously closest in and it is getting heated so much that it has volcanism, not just liquid water. Europa has a lot more obvious liquid water. It actually has vents that we've seen, uh, you know, geysers coming out. And Ganymede is further out. And so although we know that it has a magnetic field and very likely has subsurface uh, seas, it's not clear that these are going to be nearly as big as uh, those around Europa. So Europa might be a better target in terms of looking for uh, evidence of potential subsurface life. But the radiation environment for those closer in moons is also much harsher. Jupiter has a very strong, powerful magnetic field that traps huge quantities of high energy electrons. And those will hit the air spacecraft as ionizing radiation. That will break electronics over time. Europe has a lot less experience than NASA on this front. And so it's understandable that they might take second best in return for a longer life. And they will be able to go into orbit around Ganymede for several months before they finally end the mission. But that's perhaps getting ahead of things. First of all, the spacecraft needs to get to Jupiter. And to do that, even with the power of the Ariane 5, they need to perform a number of gravity assists. Now, the first gravity assist after leaving Earth is Earth. The Ariane 5's cryogenic upper stage can't relight, and that makes it hard to send the space probe off in certain directions. Even if it can get the speed, it couldn't send it directly to Venus from this uh, orientation. So that first orbit around and the re-encounter is to set up the correct direction. From there, it can fly past Venus and actually start to pick up some energy. So this is in August of 2025. The, the energy it gains kicks it out a bit further into the asteroid belt. It falls back about a year later in September 2026, encounters the Earth, and this kicks it out for another three-year loop, at which point <coughs> encountering the Earth in January 2029 and finally getting that last bit of energy that it needs to cruise all the way up to the orbit of Jupiter for that intercept. Now, while it's passing through the asteroid belt, there are opportunities for it to encounter smaller bodies, and it has been proposed that it visits the asteroid Rosa, but I'm not clear that that has actually been confirmed at this point. And so now it has to get captured at Jupiter, and that requires one of the biggest maneuvers in the mission. First of all, it does a flyby of Ganymede on the way in, and that actually robs of some energy, but then it performs this very long 800 meter per second burn to slow itself down enough that it remains captured. So over the next couple of years, it's going to make various encounters to slow itself down, reduce its orbital energy with respect to those moons. And of course, it's doing this by performing flypass with the target moons, and that allows them to get some nice good close-up science during this. This plan involves two close flybys of Europa, and these are obviously critical because of the high radiation environment. And while the spacecraft was designed with like a radiation proof enclosure where they could put the critical avionics, they still have to have a lot of stuff exposed, in particular, the solar panels that this spacecraft is relying on. The Galileo mission used a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, but the missions to Jupiter these days are using solar panels as the technology allows them. Now, the solar panels need to be extraordinarily large. In this case, there's something like 85 square meters generating something like 850 watts. The spacecraft actually needs quite a lot of power for some of its instruments. It has a ground penetrating radar, which is going to be critical for peering beneath the surfaces of these moons. So those solar cells will be degraded over time by the radiation. So anyway, by December 2034, that's when they begin or insertion into orbit around Ganymede. And that's going to return require another big performance from the engine. You'll notice that the orbit here has been carefully chosen so that the sun is kind of uh, perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. So the spacecraft never finds itself shadowed by the moon. But they can't prevent the occasional eclipse that is caused by Jupiter. Now in orbit, Ganymede becomes the focus for all the scientific instruments. So previously, the best imagery of Ganymede was like 100 meters per pixel resolution. And that was only for less than 1% of the surface. 
This is going to be able to measure down to like 10 meters per pixel for specific interesting uh, you know, sites of interest. And then by the end of 2035, the plan is to bring the mission to a close by impacting the spacecraft on Ganymede. If there is any chance of there being life on Ganymede, they don't want to contaminate it. Planetary protection is important in this case. So they want to be able to pick the site to maximize that. It's still possible that they extend the mission beyond that, but you know this is what the plan is at this point in time. When it leaves Earth, JUICE will be the largest spacecraft ever sent into deep space by humanity. It's going to carry a substantial payload of scientific hardware. Obviously, it's going to have imaging hardware, which will be able to resolve details down to you know 10 meters or less on some parts of the surface. It's going to include spectral capabilities going from the ultraviolet down into the near infrared. There is going to be imaging in the submillimeter. There's uh, a geophysics package that allows them to use uh, lidar to measure the surface, you know, structure, and a penetrating radar, which will allow them to look beneath the surface. There's also magnetometers, plasma wave instruments, radios. They'll be able to use the onboard radio hardware uh, in collaboration with ground stations on the Earth to accurately measure uh, gravitational forces and therefore measure you know, features inside the interior of the bodies it's orbiting. While it is a European mission, some of the instruments have been built by or in collaboration with the US, Japan and Israel. And this array of instruments will be used to scrutinize the three primary targets, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, to a level that has never been seen by previous missions. They will probably be used for some of the other uh, moons in the area, but what they're really interested in is characterizing the surface and the subsurface of these planets, determining the composition not just of the ice, but of the other materials that are there, looking for the actual oceans both inside the planet and where they might have some interaction with the surface, where there might be cracks, where material is leaking out. These are the things that they will be most interested in. It's believed that on Earth, life began in the oceans, and Ganymede has a lot more ocean than Earth. And that's why the scientific results of this mission have the potential to change our perception of the universe. However, don't hold your breath waiting. Those scientific results aren't going to even arrive until the next decade. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.